And when I think about the future, I think about how we can improve people's health kind of in three ways. First is thinking about how these advances in genetic technologies really pushes our understanding of the body into new frontiers. We're going to see so many new breakthroughs in medicine because of what we have learned from the pandemic. mRNA being one of the biggest ones, but now they're trying to use it for cancer and HIV AIDS and Alzheimer's, and it's a breakthrough. A second area is thinking about technologies. Both the communications technologies and the digital technologies and how we leverage those for health, as well as new technologies that we can think about augmenting the human body in ways that we've never thought about before. When you go to a hospital, right, how much time do they spend strapping you up to things and connecting you to wires? And, and why, right? Like most of those measurements, we probably should be able to do wireless at some point. If you could do all of it with a sensor that you have on a Band-Aid already, or, or like is, you know, very simple to just patch on and patch off, it saves time, that would save people's lives. It'd be a lot better for the patient in the hospital. The applications here to transform healthcare, you know, from traditional visit to hospital to just like continuously monitoring um, your visual parameters. You can customize the sensors that uh, you want, the locations of it, how many of it around. And finally, I really think about how we make health better for everybody. I'm Casper, I'm the COO of Osteoform, and we print bone. So the old way is that a patient would need some type of implant. It will be a off the shelf, small, medium, large. It wasn't the implant that fitted you. You had to fit the implant. So we've seen a big move in, in the industry where we can take a CT scan for the patient and we can make an exact fit. And that is the main goal with 3D printing. It will not be an ill-fitting implant. 70% of your bone is tricalcium phosphate. So that is what we wanted to work with. Once you've been into an accident or have any bone removed, the natural reaction from the body is to heal itself. So that is actually where we come in. We have a implant that we can make the perfect shape and size for that gap. And then the human body has to do the rest. What is critical here is that you, we can print channels and porosities where the cells can move into and migrate into the implant. The cells will then reabsorb it and uh, turn it into real living bone at a given time. So what we see is that, that we will have a future where we don't need to have foreign materials in the body or donated materials either by animals or, or humans. Over the last 200 years, we've seen incredible advancements in prosthetics. We've gone from having just a wooden peg leg, something that was a mechanical support, to very incredible devices today that are robotic and that can actually outperform human capabilities, human limbs. In contrast, the surgery that we use to actually prepare the limb for interfacing with a prosthesis hasn't really changed in that same time span. And so even with the most advanced devices today, people can't actually control the prosthesis very well or receive feedback from it. Um, so my work involved bridging that gap um, by actually redesigning the amputation procedure to allow people that are getting amputations or folks that have already had an amputation uh, to be able to rewire their muscles and nerves to better be able to control and receive feedback uh, from a prosthesis. So essentially improving the human communication to and from devices. In addition to building prostheses for the peripheral limbs, I was very interested in seeing if I could build prostheses for our internal organs, organs like the stomach and the esophagus and the intestine, things that could be implanted as well as things could, that could be swallowed. These are ingestible electronics, so they're small capsules, just like a multivitamin size that you would take, but that have, instead of chemicals, they have electronic components or mechanical components. So it's almost like a new type of a drug One of the technologies that's transforming how we think about health and disease just in the last 10 years is gene editing. This is a technique that we didn't even have in our toolbox 15, 20 years ago. And yet when we think about what that's gonna bring in the coming decades, the possibilities really seem pretty endless. We're using gene editing now kind of in two different ways. One is how we can treat or cure 
genetic diseases, where the disease is caused by a single gene that you can just precisely go in, edit that gene, kind of fix it in that person. The other piece is using gene editing to change you know, really the way that we can use different types of medicines to make them more effective. What we see in the life science and in the healthcare industry today is that everything is going to be more patient specific. You will have therapies being more dedicated one person. You have implants, you have organs, you have anything, and you will have it nearby the hospital. It's important uh, that, that it is patient specific because every human is different. Every human needs a special care. So it's not one thing that fits all. The more we understand about how nature works uh, and how these pieces fit together, we start to get really an engineer's mindset to biology. We're the tiny robots. Um, basically, almost everything we, we work on is in service of building what we would call microscopic robots or nanorobots, robots that are just too small to see by eye. And we do that by, by basically taking, you know, electronics that have been developed by the semiconductor industry for 50 years and, and slapping legs on them. <laughs> that's, that's most of what we do in like the simplest terms. Nanotechnology is, is just a shoved together of two words, right? A, a nanometer is a specific length scale. Um, it's, it's one times 10 to the minus nine meters, um, which is incredibly small. Probably the right way to look at it is it's a handful of atoms, right? An atom is about three tenths of a nanometer or something like that. Um, so when you're talking about nanotechnology, you're talking about technologies that have parts in them that are that tiny. It, it turns out if you get a, a nerve injury um, that those nerves are, are able to heal. Um, and uh, typically they, they don't do it just purely because they can't grow fast enough in order to reform a connection. Now it also turns out nerves have this weird property that if you apply forces to them, you can pull them. And by pulling them, you can make them grow faster. Now, you know, happens to work out that the force you need to trigger them to grow faster is about the same as with the robot's output. The sizes are about matched. Um, and there's no other way to do this, right? That, that typically, like, if you have nerve surgery, the, the outcomes are not great. It's usually about 50% success rates and things like that. So one of the projects we're looking at is, is basically building these robots as a surgical tool for the peripheral nervous system. That's something that could be, say, you know, implanted that would latch on to this, this damaged nerve fiber and then pull it back to the muscle it's supposed to be connected to. Um, things like that, right? What's the best analogy that you can look to in the world, right? And it's, it's you. <laughs> You're a big machine made of little tiny machines, right? All of biology is organized on this principle um, and it's wildly successful. Right, that, that the notion, even like the tiniest microorganism, like its capacity to change and alter its environment is, is extraordinary. Um, I think it's one of the things that, that like is, is just fascinating about nanotechnology is we actually sort of implicitly know from biology, like it's crazy the amount that you could, you could do if you, if you really understood that. Having things that can grow, things that can adapt, things that like learn about their environment and change the way that they respond, even if that was manifested in a material, right? Like, Say I break that steel bar or whatever, if I could put it back together and it could reheal, like how different would your world be? How many things would you have to throw out? Um, it'd be cool, right? And if it could do it on its own too, where like you don't have to hook it up to anything, it's just got the power built into it from some little tiny robot that's inside. It just does it on its own. Um, that'd be wild. Um, and, and you know, I, I think that's not outside the realm of reason that something that you could plausibly do. And then I think, you know, somewhere deep down inside, everybody sort of would like that, right? That if, oh, this beautiful thing that I had, my family for generations broke, put it together and it heals, right? Like how, how wild would that be? Probably an analogy that maybe works is like, where are the early days of computing when like a handful of people have these computers that are awkward and hard to interact with? Where you want to get to is like now, where like everyone on the planet has a computer and they can program it. And most people have kind of the same computer, right? Um, so I think that's the challenge. To do that, you have to be able to build a lot of functionality into something that's very easy to interact with. Um, and I, I think we're chipping away at that, right? That's, that's kind of where we, where we want to go. I think there's a lot of pain in this world. Being older is painful and, and, and being part of a community can be painful. So it's, it's a lot of pain. If you can reduce it, if you can get better lives, we will come together in a better way.